high on a mountain in Yellowstone National Park. A lone grizzly wanders in search of edible roots. This is no ordinary grizzly. This is bear 211, or better known to park visitors as Scarface. He walks with a noticeable limp, as well he might, as he is over 20 years old. In that time, he has wandered throughout the park and beyond. His face and ears show that he has fought in many battles with other bears over food, females, and territory. The Lamar Valley of Yellowstone's northern range can be home to Scarface, but he has roamed throughout Yellowstone's two million acres, making his life here in one of the few places where grizzlies can still exist in these 48 states. In Yellowstone, for the next several years, he pursues any opportunity he encounters, exploring any situation for the possibility of food. Large herds of bison roam the valley. They are a challenge for a grizzly to hunt. But a bison that has died a natural death is a food opportunity. And so he prowls this valley where he may find just such an opportunity. His endless wanderings take him near the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone in the den of the Hayden Valley Wolf Pack, 25 miles to the south. The family pack is resting and relaxed now. The white alpha female of the Hayden Pack has just fed her pups. But Scarface's arrival is a threat to the pack's pups. This triggers concern in the wolves. The white alpha female rises to defend her pups. A short battle ensues behind the trees. And Scarface is convinced to move on. In his earlier life, Scarface would have fished for cutthroat trout. But now he must be content with scavenging a large sucker fish, which are still plentiful in the river. And not particular about the condition. Upstream from the den in Hayden Valley, a female and her cubs have found a dead bison floating in the Yellowstone River. When Scarface comes in, the sow and her two yearlings do not argue with the old-timer. He is a definite threat to the two cubs. Male grizzlies have been known to kill cubs, even though the female would defend them. In this case, she chooses to let the large male take control of the carcass. Safety will take precedence over food for the moment. In the highest, coldest zones, whitebark pines flourish where other trees cannot subsist. In late autumn, the whitebark pine has produced a crop of cones containing seeds of rich caloric content. This food source attracts many Yellowstone residents. Scarface will be found high on the slopes of Mount Washburn, feeding on the nuts of this tree. This will keep him on higher slopes, where he will have less conflict with humans. The gentle snows accumulate all winter sometimes forming a solid foundation. Large male grizzlies may be out of their dens in February, although usually in March. Warmer winters are making this more common in Yellowstone, but females with cubs will emerge later, about April or May. He is on the eternal search for food. 
Another bear has discovered a winter-killed carcass at the edge of the river. This grizzly has scented it too. The smaller bear will not contest the larger. The dominant bear will always have the reward. It's snowing, but this is not winter. Instead, just a usual June snowstorm in Yellowstone. This female grizzly has been observed on Mount Washburn for five years. A bird exiting her nest in the aspen tree has attracted her attention. With some difficulty, she climbs to the nest to investigate. In spite of a common misperception, grizzlies actually can climb trees. She has more important things on her mind, as this is the time of year females without cubs come into estrus. She and her mate continue their courting, in spite of the near blizzard conditions. Their courting will continue for hours. Actually, they may spend a few days together in the mating process. At the end of the day, most of the snow has melted, and the courting pair display a tender closeness. Mount Washburn is all that is left of a mountain chain that was blown up by the supervolcano of 600,000 years ago. In these high alpine slopes, the pika harvests and stores hay, the plants that will sustain him through the winter. He hides his stash in little caves because he'll be buried under feet of snow for six months. This high elevation harbors the white bark pine. These cones contain seeds that are high in fat. Ideal food for grizzly bears and a host of other high alpine residents, too. For some, the cones are there for the picking. But the grizzly sow depends on others to first gather the seeds, especially the red squirrel which harvests the cones, then hides their seeds in underground caches. The cones mature in the autumn, and she will continue to dig out caches until she goes into hibernation. This is an incredibly important food source. During good cone years, 90% of a bear's caloric intake will come from these seeds. Even black bear cubs will take advantage of the grizzly's excavating talents to find any remaining seeds that she's overlooked. The female black bear is drawn to investigate too. The trees are being killed by two decades of global warming. This threatens their high elevation position as they cannot compete with other species of trees that are moving up the slopes. In good years, she will concentrate on the white bark pine seeds until they are buried too deep under the snow. Then, in late October or early November, the pregnant female will select a den. Most likely on the north side of the mountain.
In the den, the eggs that were fertilized in June will begin the process of growing into cubs. In May, the washburn sow emerges from her den with two small cubs. At this elevation, May can seem more like March, but to the cubs that know nothing but the confines of a den, this is playtime. At birth, the cubs are tiny, about one pound. In the den, they lived entirely on their mother's milk. But now, they will begin to sample the plant foods their mother eats. She will move across the mountain face in search of roots and other vegetation. Their energy seemed boundless. The grizzly's intelligence level makes them creatures of curiosity. A telegraph line from 100 years ago will capture their interest. Even as they're learning to eat new foods, the mother will continue nursing them for a time. Her milk is 30% butter fat. The cubs will depend on her milk for five months. And after that, they may still nurse occasionally until they separate from her. This Washburn mother continues with her two cubs in early summer. But then she disappears for a month into the backcountry. When she reappears, there are four cubs with her. DNA tests have identified the mother of these two new cubs, a sow who was attacked by wolves. In the encounter, two of her three cubs became separated from their mother. Adopting cubs is unusual in the grizzly world. In this case, not only were the two females related, but the father of all the cubs was Scarface. The Washburn female now has four cubs to nurse and to dig out squirrel caches for. The next spring finds her digging out a squirrel cache, but only one cub watches her. Somehow, three cubs have vanished. Even in the best of circumstances, only about half of all cubs survive to maturity. In Yellowstone, geology rules the ecosystem. The geothermal activity deep underground affects the food sources of all its creatures. Near Roaring Mountain, on the west side of the park, Spring comes much earlier due to the warming of the ground, and bison may linger there. But winter still persists outside these areas. Bear cubs usually leave their mother in their third summer. For the next several years, these bears are known as sub-adults, the teenagers of the bear world. Then, just as in our own teenagers, some activities seem to defy explanation. A porcupine is something to be investigated by the young bear. They have to learn about porcupines the hard way. Uh. 
The porcupine quills are barbed, so will not come out on their own. They may continue to work their way through the bear's paw, eventually allowing him to recover. It may take a few months. He endures the pain stoically. Small rodents can be found in unexpected places. The bear's sense of smell guides him to these locations. Although he depends mostly on plant food, he relishes meat. These little voles may be caught surprisingly often. But his diet includes earthworms, ants, moths, grasshoppers in season, as well as seeds, roots, mushrooms, and berries. He sometimes grazes grass like a cow. He's the ultimate omnivore. But he constantly searches for more opportunity. His mother was a killer of young elk calves, an important food source in early summer. Now the sub-adult is on his own and has a few things to learn about when to chase elk. The calves are too old and thus too fast for the bear to capture. Failure comes often in these pursuits. He pursues any opportunity he encounters exploring any situation for the possibility of food. The duck stays close enough to tempt him. In reality, she is leading him away from her nest and clutch of eggs. This pursuit is futile as well. The subadult tears apart a beaver lodge made of small willow sticks. The beavers have no choice in building materials. Willow is their primary diet, but usually the branches are thick enough to build bear-proof lodges. Here, he has success, capturing several young beaver this day. A nutritional bonus for him. Equally unusual to adopting another female's cubs is the arrival of a sow at Swan Lake Flats with four cubs of her own. This has been recorded only once in Yellowstone. Most commonly, a female will have two cubs. Three cubs are not unusual. Her sense of smell is better than a bloodhound. While a litter of four cubs is unusual, it does happen sometimes. In this litter, there is one cub about half the size of the other three. He does not play as much, probably because of his size and he often lags behind. Come on! <coughs> the 
The following spring, she appeared near Swan Lake with just two cubs, now yearlings. The third spring, her two surviving cubs are almost the size of their mother, about 300 pounds. At this stage in their lives, the cubs would leave and or be chased away by a boar interested in their mother. She would then mate and the cycle would begin again. Incredibly, the cubs stayed with her into the fourth spring. Something about four in the life of this female, who will always be known as Quad Mom. The park's management of grizzlies has changed over the past century. Once, bears were fed garbage, and dumps were a location to watch bears. In the 1970s, dumps were closed and many bears were not able to adapt to this policy and were shot. After the 1980s, bears increased in number until there are about 600 in the ecosystem now. As the numbers increased, some grizzlies, especially sows with cubs and some adults, moved into unused habitat near the park roads for a few weeks. For a few weeks, this grizzly family delighted park visitors with their antics. Showing their delight for bison pies, and slamming each other to the ground. Then, one day, they left for higher elevations. A grizzly's world is driven by ever-changing food sources. The area surrounding Yellowstone Lake offers a different habitat for grizzlies. Once, it had one of the highest densities of grizzlies in the southern 48 states. Today, bears still wander these shores, which are home for a variety of other animals. A single cub with no siblings to play with must turn to its mother for his entertainment. Like virtually all grizzly mothers, she is an attentive and accommodating mom. In May, along the lake shore, the meadows have begun to shed their snow. The melting snow softens the ground and gophers and voles can be easily dug out. The coyote adds a new twist for the young cub to investigate.
this cub is not intimidated by the coyote. He has backup. The coyote decides to sneak away. Tangling with a mother grizzly is bad for your health. She chooses to move on. The lake's northeast shore is a very warm thermal area. There is another greenhouse effect here. A grizzly has taken over an elk carcass killed by wolves. The bison are aware of the grizzly, but not intimidated by him. Grass begins to grow long before the surrounding area is free of ice. The gray alpha female returns to the pack's kill, now surrounded by bison. The young bulls practice for more serious fights, which will come later in August. The three characters go round and round. The grizzly chases the wolf. But must retreat from the larger bison. The wolf, agile enough to avoid the bison, waits for the bison to leave. Studies have shown that over half of the grizzly's food intake comes from meat in these locations. Outside Yellowstone National Park, a grizzly's diet may be only 5% meat. Their food is primarily vegetation. Eventually, the bear will take over the carcass again. The wolf is playing with fire here. In this domain, the bison rule, completely disinterested in the contest between wolf and bear. As with any large body of water, Yellowstone Lake produces a great number of non-biting flies. These flies drop their eggs in the water and then die. Their bodies are washed ashore and pile up along the margins of the lake. Bears are drawn to the source of food. Insects are a most important food item in several locations. Far to the south and east, there are mountain meadows that are carpeted with cutworm moths late in summer, where bears have learned to feed on multitudes of them. Those moths are an extremely important food item, ranking with pine seeds for caloric value. Often in the afternoon, summer winds bring high waves, just the sort for a family of river otters to frolic in. All bears seem to have personalities, and the one known as Swimmer is no exception. Swimmer is a medium-sized male, about 10 years old. He has found a deer carcass, which the waves have brought in. A small sub-adult investigates the situation. But in the bear world, there is little sharing of carcasses. Swimmer makes sure that this characteristic is maintained and understood. In the afternoon heat, Swimmer takes a dip to cool off in the 50 degree lake water. He can endure extremely cold temperatures, but he has a low tolerance for heat.
grizzlies are generally solitary animals, and he takes his pleasure alone. And after a good swim, it's time for a nap. Nearly every summer, there are wildfires in the park, usually caused by lightning. Fires and drought have affected the creeks and streams that feed into Yellowstone Lake. Otters thrive on fish they find there. Cutthroat trout were once the primary item in their diet, but the native cutthroat trout numbers have declined. Lake trout, introduced into Yellowstone illegally, eat the native cutthroat trout. But efforts to curtail the illegal lake trout are beginning to pay off. Cutthroat are becoming more numerous. And the grizzly has been seen foraging for them in small streams feeding into the lake. A bald eagle can take a trout because they are near the surface where he can reach them. Cutthroat trout were once an important food for grizzlies along the streams feeding into Yellowstone Lake. And so he is foraging for them. The fires that periodically burn the forests around the lake also release nutrients into the soil and opens up the tree canopy so that more plants are available to the grizzly bear. Grizzly bears eat 162 different plant species here in Yellowstone. His diet includes earthworms, ants, and berries. These salad diets are lower in caloric value, but are so abundant, they comprise a large portion of the grizzly's food intake. The seasons refuse to fall into a normal pattern in these high mountains. Spring may seem like winter. The playfulness of the cub will persist into adulthood. He's adept at entertaining himself. A free ride is always fun, too. The valley is also home to several coyote packs. At this den, there is a litter of pups, with three adults to care for them. and the adults are constantly alert to any grizzly that may wander nearby. The mother coyote tries to distract the young grizzly away from her den. And she succeeds. When spring finally arrives in full bloom, grizzlies are often seen in Hayden Valley, digging out gopher burrows, and occasionally a gopher. The sedge meadows along the Yellowstone River are especially used for this activity. Grizzly cubs seem to have an eternal fascination for bison pies. This cub is no exception. This dried object is the single most popular toy for young bear cubs.
On a spring morning, sandhill cranes have new chicks in the nest. Their unique calls now are a response to a family of approaching bears, an alarm cry. The male goes to meet the grizzly family, attempting to distract them from the nest. In an astonishing, almost unbelievable display, the grizzly mother turns away. Drama that may occur every day in Yellowstone. It must be a rare win for the sandhill crane. The snow in Hayden Valley is much too deep for elk to remain here during the winter. But by spring, they have moved into the valley just in time to have their calves. For three weeks in early June, grizzlies search for hidden calves, or chase after the herds in hopes that a calf will drop behind. By late June, the calves are fast enough to keep out of harm's way but the grizzly keeps trying, compelled by her desire for flesh. Hayden Valley is perhaps best known for its large bison herd. In August, the bulls fight over the right to mate. Some of these fights are deadly, so grizzlies will cruise the valley searching for a dead bison. In these high country mountain retreats, the grizzly bear has no natural enemies, except for another grizzly. This male protects a carcass that a female with cubs also has detected. Wolves have been waiting out the bear, but the grizzly has taken over. The larger male will not be easily dislodged. The wolves take advantage of the confrontation to attack the cubs. The female rushes to their defense. They're beginning to show that grizzly grid on their own, but with mom to back them up again. The female hesitates. But then, astonishingly, the male gives way to her. The wolves attack the cubs again. Ironically, wolves may be contributing to the increase of the grizzly population because of the game they are able to kill. The male returns, and there is one more tense confrontation. This time, she gives way to the old male, leaving the kill to him. Maybe the better part of wisdom.
It's March, and bison have begun their migration to higher elevations, following new growth. Their route passes blacktail ponds, where warm springs create weakness in the ice. The cow is doomed. There is no escape from the frigid water. Soon, her body will be frozen into the ice. As many as six bison have met this fate in a single winter. The rest of the herd shows concern, but they have no way to help. Her carcass will remain under the ice, frozen until warmer weather. The grizzly also breaks through the thinning ice, but he is better equipped to cope with it. Large bears, just out of hibernation, know that this is the place to go for a meal. Like any other scavenger, the bear will be quick to investigate. The rotting ice is not a detriment to him. He's almost impervious to the cold. Bison are on the move again. Bluebirds have returned in the northern part of Yellowstone Park. The bison may have wintered in the northern area around blacktail ponds. The herd hesitates briefly but one yearling attempts to jump an open arm of water. She makes it across. A second young cow decides to cross in like manner. She can't get a grip on the icy bank. Her desperate struggles are to no avail. The banks are too steep to allow her to get a foothold. If she will only turn back the direction she came from, she could escape. The herd has continued on, and the yearling is anxious to catch up with them. Cautiously, she tests the decaying ice and edges forward. When it holds, she gains confidence. It seems to support her weight. Once again, she's unable to climb the steep bank. The cow is unable to help. Her struggles continue for several hours. By sunset, the cold water has sapped her energies away. As the rolling seasons evolve, the temperatures rise. A week later, the pond has started to thaw around the edges. In the warming days, a large boar soon discovers the newest victim. A splash sends a raven on his way. He will have to wait. With a full stomach, the bear retreats to sleep, but not before facing off with a wolf. A sense of respect and curiosity may sometimes engage them both, briefly.
the temperatures rise. In the warming days, the ice disappears, but the bison carcass does not. In the life of Yellowstone, many creatures can feed on the bison. In these remote pockets of the hidden world, life plays out, a predestined role, constantly changing, yet forever constant. Nothing is wasted. Perhaps signaled by the ravens, the coyote is also drawn to investigate. He can see the meal, but there's no place for him to stand. He can't feed on it. A grizzly sow and her cub find the carcass. The cub is in his third season, and the sow is trying to wean him. Her motherly instincts are now dissipated, although she will tolerate him enough to allow him to share this find. A hunting boar, though, makes it his business to check this out. The cub sees the boar as a dangerous threat. The boar is interested in the female as well as the food, because she is about ready for mating. The cub has left. He has now been weaned. He's on his own. After leaving their mother, the sub-adults often stay together and continue their playful ways. These are actually preparations for more serious conflict later on. These young bears skirmish in a half-hearted way. Next year, the urge will deepen and develop into genuine rage. Even as sibling adults, though, they could eventually face each other in a vicious duel for dominance. These hostilities almost always occur over food or mating. A carcass is always a prize to protect and possess. The competition can be fierce. Like sumo wrestlers, these heavyweights of the bear world push, shove, and bite until one gives up. A coyote waits his turn. But he is far down the pecking order at a kill. Unexpectedly, it is the loser of the fight that follows the coyote in a game of hide-and-seek. Grizzly bears have distinct personalities. One, called Thumper, seemed to delight in toying with ravens. He would bait them to the carcass, then charge. If he left the carcass for any reason, he would continue his jealous watch. His sense of possessiveness is a powerful characteristic within the grizzly bear family. In 
Yellowstone, the grizzly bear's habitat is both large and varied. The bear can be found on the highest mountains, at other times in the deep valleys, his stomach dictating where he will be found. Along the way, the grizzly interacts with wolves, coyotes, and all the other species that make up this unique wild sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs>